everyone. Um, we're still inside. We're supposed to still be inside, right? Yeah, we're anyway, not sure. We are just to make sure because we don't want to get sick. Um, by the way, I'm Emily, and that is. And I'm Elt from the other side of the basement. Hi. Hi, Emily. It smells like lavender on this side. What does it smell like on your side? Um, chocolate chip cookies, but it has nothing to do with baking chocolate chip cookies because there's no chocolate chip cookies at all anywhere. None. Oh. It's just a, it's a new candle I got. Oh, well, I'll have to try that candle sometimes. It sounds delicious. Uh-huh. None left. No candle left. Oh, well. Well, today, even though we're so far apart, we're talking about something that connects our hearts. So we're talking about one of the best stage plays of all time ever in the history of plays and musicals, and that is Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's just the most brilliant musical ever. Almost the most brilliant, it's, but basically the amazing. most brilliant. Yeah. I just, I, I can't say enough good things about it. Um, let's talk about the movie first, though, and then we'll talk about the play. We can end on a high note. Yeah, also, Emily got to see the play live, which not a lot of people can say, but she didn't see the movie live while it was being filmed. Yeah. I was a little bit too young, I think. Right. I don't know if they were letting people on location. We're talking about the Disney animated one. Were they letting people on location for that? I don't remember. Um, I think I think it was one in the studio, though. I don't think they actually filmed in France. Oh, I think okay. Is what it was. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people think it, but they just they just made a replica. Right. Okay. Sure That's not. good to explain. Um, it is one of my favorite Disney movies of all time. It's probably one of the few Disney movies that's a little bit higher on the scale. But we we figured out the scale really for the musical, but um, it's a little bit violent, um, and the romance there is definitely some kinky stuff between Frollo and Esmeralda hinted at. Um, but I was re-watching it the other day, and none of that stuff, I didn't get it when I was a kid, you know? Right. So, it's there, and if you're a grown-up, you understand what's going on, but if you're young, it's just scary. Like, there's nothing specific to the scariness other than, like, bad guy, you know? Like, oh, he's into this woman, and he's trying to, he's, what's the thing now when you, like, give a woman her life, or, like like a job or have sex with me type of thing. Anyway, it's kind of like that. So it's a little creepy. But again, if you're watching it as a kid, you don't really know. So it's sort of an interesting thing on the romance scale. And then violence, um, some people get hot molten metal poured on them. But you don't actually see the hot molten metal get poured on any individual people. So the violence is still more like, you know, Disney level violence or people getting apples thrown at them, which is bad. And it's done in a really like bullying type of way. Um, well, also, I love that movie. yeah, and also, even though some of the scales are high for Disney film, also from all the Disney films, are probably some of the most substance. Um, oh, there's actually like a real yeah. pointed. Yeah, well, it's interesting because it's people. I mean, there's religion in it, and people making moral choices, like see this. You know, uh, do I stick with my orders or do I go against my orders to do what's right? So it's a very interesting, it's interesting that they chose it for an adaptation, but I'm so glad they did because the music in it is just stunning. It's phenomenal. It's beautiful music. There's a choir and religious stuff happening in the background of a lot of the songs, and it was also, there are a lot of um, themes. So like each character or different places have themes, and the music is repeated, and it's beautiful. Also some interesting little trivia. Um, so Trollo was the villain. He's one of I'd be like the best villain in Disney. It's just in Disney, right? Because he's like a real villain. Well, because he's also compl he's not so straightforward. They give him like a moral struggle, not a moral struggle, but they give him a struggle that it's not just I want to yeah. be evil. Right, and he's not like a magical, mystical queen or something who's evil, who's like an evil beyond anything within the human realm. He's a human evil. Right. But what's interesting is that in the book, the original book, he's a church leader. I don't remember exactly what he is, but he's a church leader. But in the movie, they made him a judge because they thought that it wouldn't be so positively thought of to have the villain be a church leader. Um, 
And then the actor who played him was actually the villain, one of the villains in Beauty and the Beast, the guy who runs the insane asylum that Gaston wants to send Belle's father to. And he has such an evil voice that Disney was like, oh my gosh, we need to make you be a villain in another one of our movies. Because it's such, we've actually, the guy who played Trollo on stage also, when I looked up other stuff that he had done, it was all villain roles. And he just, some people just have that voice. And it was such a dark, heavy Oh, so was good. Like, he could never play anything but a villain. Oh, and one other interesting thing about the movie, um, in the scene where Frollo sees Esmeralda dancing in the fire, originally they wanted to make Esmeralda, I think this is true, but I guess I should say allegedly, uh, they wanted to make Esmeralda dancing naked. Uh-oh. But they realized... But in the flames, you don't really see her body. Right. It's like her body as flames, but even in the flames, you can tell the difference between naked and clothes. So they put clothes on her. Because it is, after all, still a movie for maybe not your youngest children. I wouldn't show, like, my four-year-old, but, like, my ten, eight, ten-year-old, maybe? Yeah. So. I'm glad they kept their head on about that. Yeah. And then finally, in all their genius at Disney, after adapting other movies to musicals that shouldn't have been <clears throat> looking at you little mermaid and lion king yeah. they made it into a musical which makes the most sense because the music is so and not just, i mean music in a lot of disney movies is great but in this one particular it needs the stage it needs and what it needs is a choir backing it up which is part of the reason why i didn't make it to broadway but whatever details right because yeah. there's just too many but, people i think 32 voices. Can you imagine the vocal range? You don't have to. You can listen to the soundtrack and you will know. Oh, that's so beautiful. I actually knew one of the people in the choir that sang uh, in the, at La Jolla Playhouse. Oh, uh, woohoo! Played there. So, you know, I don't know what that means, except it was kind of a cool thing just to hear him talk about it. But, okay, so that show... Uh, so based off the novel by Victor Hugo, for those of you who don't know your classic literature, for those of you who don't know your classic literature, I think we're still stuck at home, so read it. You can probably find it online. That's, oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, oh, so the music by Alan Menken and Larry by Stephen Schwartz, and that was for the movie and the musical, but Menken and Schwartz came back to add some, because they added some songs when they brought it to the stage. Right, because the stage, they developed the story much more, and certain things that they had to a little bit tone down, right? Because I think in the in the film, officially, Esmeralda, Esmeralda didn't really die, but in the in the stage, she does. Um, right. And Alan Menken basically wrote everything for Disney, so if you don't know who Alan Menken is, then you've obviously never seen a Disney film. And don't tell Emily that, because when she does emerge from the basement, she's going to come after you. And then Stephen Schwartz is just amazing. He wrote a lot of really good shows. Um, Pip I think he did the music for uh, Prince of Egypt, and he's written Pippin, um, Wicked. Wicked, that's right, is Steven Schwartz. He's, he's, in, he's, they're both amazingly talented. And this is definitely some of their finest work, hands down. The songs, yeah. I don't know, like everyone is just, um, everyone is, even Hellfire, which is, um, Frollo singing about his, like, lust for Esmeralda is still so good because of the parts of him that it shows. And then you've got a song, well, the opening song, The Bells of Notre Dame is an amazing song. And it's actually, if you listen to the house. Yeah. Oh, no, if you listen to it in the film and you follow the jester, like the king of the gypsy's voice, you have to follow his voice because the way it goes up at the end, so the way it goes up in the end, I don't know how anybody's voice does that. So you have to listen for it to hear it going up. They don't, yeah, I don't know if they got that for the stage, but that opening song and that's also they close with it is incredible. Um, that song that, what's, that's a song that Esmeralda's, it's God Help the Out Outcasts is phenomenal. And the woman that they cast, for Esmeralda for the stage has such a rich and beautiful voice. It's one of the nicest female voices in general. I'm kind of partial to the female voices that are deeper and richer than the higher ones. Um, yeah. I just like it better. And then last song that I'm just going to gush about is um, Made of Stone that Quasimodo sings. That one is just... the And the guy who plays Quasimodo is just... I think Michael Arden is his name. And it's I didn't get... It took me a minute to get it because... In the stage show, he plays him a little bit deaf. And it's not... He says, like, look, if a guy's ringing the bells all the time, it would make sense that he'd be hard of hearing. And first of all, I'm glad that singing-wise he doesn't sing like that, which I always like it when they don't make them sing in, like, a weird voice. 
But I think he plays the part just so, he just everything about it is just so good. It's such a good show. Yeah. He does, yeah. He plays it like he's deaf, so his speech isn't... I mean, it's clear enough to hear on a stage, but you definitely understand that... And he incorporates some sign language into it, like someone who was actually... It, it's amazing. And the... There's just something about the choir in the background that gives it such a, a richness yeah. and fullness, and also because a lot of what the choir is singing is religious music, or religious sounding music, it. Like, it just sets the tone and the setting for the show the whole time. You remember, like, you know, the, the darkness, like Hellfire, right? Right. Because he's singing, he's trying to figure out, his like, a small quandary. And then there's the choir voices, which is like the voice right. of God. Right. Right? While he's dealing with his most base desires. Right. It's so good. It's so good. And also, um... The one cat, the one thing I didn't necessarily like about it is that everyone's in love with Esmeralda, which I don't know why everyone has to be in love with her. Even though each person is kind of different, because you have um, the captain who's in love with her in like a real romance kind of way, and then you have Frollo who's in love with her from like a lust kind of way, and then Quasimodo who's in love with her, but more just because she sees him as being, she she's the first yeah. person to really see him and say, "No, you're not ugly," which is also one of the points of it's it actually was an interesting change that they did because. In the film, the opening song, um, the, you know, when they do, here is a riddle, well, guess, guess if you can, right? They say, who is the monster and who is the man? But then they switch, they tweak that line for the stage, and they do what makes a monster and what makes a man? And almost, you want to, you almost can't give the flat answer to that, because in the stage, they do show why Frollo comes to hate gypsies. He sees them as the people who took his brother away from him. So sure, it's, un, it's, it's not an okay hatred, but you do see... He kind of went in the wrong direction, right? He came to the wrong conclusions, but you see why he made the conclusions. And you see why people yeah. have been led to the choices that they were led to. So that just gives a lot of depth to the characters. And that's also part of what the film, yes, and the stage especially is just showing you that, right, it's not the outer looks, that just because Quasimodo looks like a monster and he's deformed doesn't mean he can't be a beautiful person. And people that we might think look perfect and beautiful are not necessarily beautiful because it's an outward appearance. It's so... It's so good, and there's so much substance to it, which obviously gives it very high approval in our eyes. That it just—they did such a good job. They just really did. Disney really won yeah. on that one. Good job. The only thing for people who are really big Hunchback fans, you might be disappointed that the gargoyles are not in the stage adaptation. They're there, but they're not the fun, loving jokes there that they are in right. the movie. But it totally makes sense because in the movie, you know, every Disney character needs. Like an animal sidekick or some sort of sidekick right, right. joke. So in the movie, that's the purpose they serve. In the play, there's so much else going on that to have them in there would have totally taken away from it, like the trolls and Frozen. That's yeah, we don't need to yeah, no, yeah. Um, so it makes sense that they're not in the play, but they're they're not. So if you're hoping for them, um, don't go looking there. Watch the movie. So that fun song um, that they sing, mostly Jason Alexander. Yeah, it doesn't happen, but it's it's better. Yeah, there's actually the one song that they sing about the saint, whoever, with the head off. That's kind of like a silly song in the middle of everything, even though it's, I guess it's trying to show Quasimodo's the way he sees it. So it is kind of silly, but overall, it's so fantastic, the musical. It's so it's so annoying that it didn't make it to Broadway, but it just it transcends Broadway. It's just so good. Did we mention that yeah. it's good? Because it is good. Oh, yeah, it's really good. I don't think people understood, so let's just to be clear, folks, it's good. Actually, it's great. And the greater thing about it is that in terms of violence, language, and romance, it's actually pretty, like, okay, yeah, there's, like, a little bit of violence, um, but I think there's, like, some, like, a bar fight or things like, something like yeah. that, and, and Esmeralda, spoiler alert, she does die and I think we know how she, we don't see her die we know how she died so there's definitely a congestion of violence there um there's obviously some romance like a chew of romance um the thing that really puts it over into a two I would say is Frollo's creepy oh he's so creepy yeah because there's romance in like the traditional Disney way and musical way of people being in love but then there's also his yeah uh, he's so creepy yeah and then there's 
honestly, I can't remember the language, but, well, they definitely say, like, hell and damn, because they're talking about, like... Yeah, from a religious aspect, yeah, yeah. yeah. But otherwise, I actually think, again, sort of like the movie itself, you maybe wouldn't bring your six-year... You you could bring a six-year-old to see Lion King. This one you might bring your 10 or 12-year-old to see, but you could bring... It's still a Disney production, so it's still relatively friendly. But it's darker... Um, it okay with you. Yeah, I don't see, I don't think the stage is, it's not, I don't think it's aimed for kids. I don't see, no. I don't see it like that. Like, yeah, Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, those are very kid friendly. I don't, I think this is a much more adult show because it's not fun and cutesy. It's not colorful right. in that, re, in that sense. Um, no, it's not for kids, but it's at least clean enough that if you thought, like, maybe a young teen, like, teen, yeah. 14, I think could appreciate it the same way like West Side Story is a like different than seeing the music man it's a little bit of a heavier musical right but right. the That's right true. age could appreciate it right also I want you to appreciate it because it's the most brilliant musical ever written. so brilliant just go or listen to the soundtrack listen to all of it you might be able to find um, a full version of it somewhere on YouTube if it's still up that from any of the playhouses that had it you could definitely find the soundtrack um, yeah, buy this. I just doing right now. yeah. I don't. Why is anybody doing anything else? Stop. When as soon as you're done listening to this, just go find the soundtrack. It's it's yeah. phenomenal. Well, make sure you listen to all our episodes. But yeah, then go. right. Exactly. After all the episodes. Exactly. Good point. Um. Actually, do you want to go watch it again? We can film opposite sides of the room. Yeah, we could project. Oh, we could project it on the blank wall. That's that's the blank wall. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, make the popcorn. Can you get it set up? Yeah, but make sure that you make mine with wear gloves when you make my popcorn, please. Thanks. Oh yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll put a mask, and I definitely won't sneeze on it. Right, and send it over in the pulley system that I rigged up, please, because you can't oh, yeah, hand it to sure. me. Okay, good. Always be careful. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go make the popcorn. Um, see you all, you guys, later. Listen and enjoy the show. Yeah. And thanks for listening. Bye.